My name is Rabbi Lawrence. This is a six-part series on dating, and uh, we've covered a few uh, pretty big areas when it comes to dating, what to look for, how to act on a first date, what to do and not to do on a first date. So now we're going to assume that things are going well. Big assumption, thank you. Thank you, Hillary. That's right, it was a big assumption. Thanks for reminding me, yes. Let's make a big theoretical leap that actually the relationship is actually going okay and you're moving forward. So the question tonight, we're going to begin with one question and we're going to develop into another one. The question tonight is, what makes a great relationship? Is that a fair question? What makes a great relationship? And this actually applies not just obviously to people dating in great relationships, but also to people who are married, hopefully in great relationships as well, right? Relationships in general. And I'm going to start with a, uh, a great campaign, actually, by a guy called Nate uh, Bagley, or Bagley, I think his name was. It looks like Bagley. Uh, I hope it doesn't look like a bagel. And he was sick and tired of hearing all these love stories, and he found that, and all these relationship stories, and he found that people fell into kind of like two categories when it came to relationships, scandal and divorce or for dating people, break up. So what he did was, this ain't pretty cool, he started a Kickstarter campaign, used all his life savings to tour the country and to interview couples. And he spent a lot of money and a lot of time interviewing couples all over America. And he interviewed rich couples, and he interviewed poor couples, religious couples and atheistic couples. Couples have been together for a short time. Couples who have been together for over 70 years. He even interviewed couples of people who are in arranged marriages and polygamous couples as well. There you go. And what he did was, and he's hoping to make it into a documentary, but he's got a lot of data. And what he did was he kind of pulled out certain things just kept repeating themselves again and again and again and again. So I picked out five. Well, actually, he picked them out. But I want to just go into them a little bit. And what he calls the... Keys to making a successful relationship. Let's go through those and let's see where we take them. And then we'll focus on something which he mentions towards the end. So number one, what's the key which he found from all these couples all over America? So number one he found in a successful relationship, which is going to apply very much to dating, is self-love. People have to love and be happy and content with themselves. That's number one. He found the happiest couples always consisted of two, sometimes more, emotionally <laughs> healthy and independently happy individuals. Many people think, well, when I get my job, I'll be happy. When I finally get rid of my job, I'm going to be happy. When I get into that relationship, I'm going to be happy. When I get out of the relationship, I'm going to be happy. When I move into that new city, I'll be happy. When I get out of this crazy city, I'll be happy. Everyone's kind of like, you know, and one of my comments always is, wherever you go, that's where you are, you know? He found you've got to be happy and present. Now, we can't always be happy all the time unless you're on some, you know, illegal narcotic. That's not possible. But there's a certain amount of self-acceptance and happiness that we have. Happens to be that this is a very Jewish concept as well, and a lot of which I've discussed with you overseas as well. We know that the Torah speaks in the book of Leviticus, in the chapter which we call Kedoshim, Holiness, Viahafta Lorecha Kamocha. You have to love your neighbor like you love yourself. This is a very, very famous statement, right? mostly because the Christians, the early Christians, cut and pasted it into the New Testament. But actually, before it got over there, it was in the Torah. I don't call it the Old Testament because it's still new to us, um, but it was actually in the Torah. It's a very interesting statement. It's that you have to love your neighbor like you love yourself. So the commentators ask, why can't you just say you have to love your neighbor? Just love everyone else. You know, like, you have the Hare Krishna, just go and hug people, love people, and that's not good enough. You have to love others like you love yourself, meaning if you don't love yourself, it's impossible to love anybody else. It starts with self-worth. I'm going to make a statement, which is a very broad and general statement, and that is our generation is suffering from chronic low self-esteem. That's just a given. Why we've got to this point, I don't believe this existed in our grandparents, our great-grandparents' lifetime. They were of a different caliber. Those people had a relationship with their grandparents or maybe their great-grandparents knew it. 
This is a modern disease. Why? You can speak to your therapist about it, right, for the history of this. But that is for sure where we are. It's definitely going to impact our relationships. Working on behalf of the Kamocha, you don't love yourself, you love no one else. That's one thing he found. He found that those in good relationships treated themselves with the same type of love and respect and care that they treated their partner, or at least they tried to, he found. That's number one. Number two, emotionally healthy people know how to forgive. This was another major part. We're going to focus more on this a little bit later, but just to mention it now because he doesn't mention it. And they're able to acknowledge their part in any disagreement or conflict and own it. Take responsibility for it. I did mention, actually, I think in previous class, that we see that the first couple, Adam and Eve, got into a bit of a spat, a bit of a fight in Gan Eden, in the Garden of Eden. And what was the first response of Adam? He blames Eve. It wasn't me. It was the woman you gave me. You know? And she's like, it wasn't me. It was the serpent. And everyone's blaming everyone else. And what happened? They get kicked out. The commentators say, had they actually taken responsibility and owned their mistake, they'd still be in the Garden of Eden and we'd be there too because we are their descendants, you see? So this, they say, is the first thing. Taking responsibility and that is a sign of emotional, healthy people. Three, commitment. Commitment. After that, emotional health came an unquestioning level of commitment. The happiest couples knew that if things got real, it's not the word he used, but let's use the word things. Their significant other wasn't going to walk out on them. Now, I'll talk about this for a minute. Because I deal, obviously, in a population where pretty much everyone in our day and age, apart from the religious uh, young men and women, which I'm also involved in, in the orthodox world, pretty much everyone else lives together before they get married. Is that right? That's a fair assessment. Now, we did mention before that the chance of you actually getting married, statistically, if you live together beforehand, actually increases. It goes up to 70%. But the chance of divorce also increases. And we actually left it as a question why that would be. Once again, people live together before they get married, have a higher chance of actually getting married, but they also have a higher incidence of divorce. Here's one interesting thing in terms of commitment. They knew that even if things got hard, no, especially if things got hard, they were better off together. If things got hard, they were better off together. That's commitment. I think in this living together before marriage, it's kind of one foot in, one foot out. And by the way, many people live together before they get married, and they're getting married because it's convenience. We're living together, might as well get married, you know? It's kind of like what we're going to do, break up and, uh, and then find someone else. Let's not go through that. Let's just get married. That's what most people do. I believe that to be true. You know? I don't think they don't hate each other, but maybe that wouldn't have been their first choice, right? Or maybe even second. However, when it comes to this idea of commitment, there's a problem. And I believe it is lacking for people who live together because there's always in the back of their mind, I'm not in completely because I'm not married. That's difficult. That's going to hinder, I believe, and you can argue with me, it's going to hinder a little bit of your absolute total commitment. By the way, people get married and still aren't fully committed. So that's even that's not a guarantee. But just because you're living together, it definitely doesn't help. Which leads to the next point, which is trust. Now, trust is one of these big, big, big ones. And trust is one of these weird things that is so easy to break, yet so difficult to build. You can break it in a moment. Think about it. You can break trust. Think about relationships you've been in. Trust can break in a moment. You see something, you read something, you hear about them, and suddenly your trust is gone. But to build it can take weeks, months, years sometimes. Happy couples in successful relationships, he says, trust each other. And they have earned each other's trust. That takes time. That does not happen overnight. They don't worry about the other person trying to undermine them or sabotage them. Common word I hear in dating. Because they've proven over and over again that they are each other's greatest advocate and that trust is built through actions and not only words. It's day after day. It really takes time. Just like a bank account. You put money in. We all want to become millionaires overnight. It's not going to happen for any of us, right? For most of us, anyway. It uh, hasn't happened to me yet. But you put a little bit of money in, and a little bit of money in, a little bit of money in, and eventually it builds up. That's what they tell you, right? However, when it comes to trust, it's the same thing. It's a little bit here, and a little bit over there, and a little bit elsewhere. Finally, and he calls this for some reason, the icing on the cake. And I like this one. I hope you appreciate it. And he calls this one intentionality. People he found in successful relationships were intentional. What does that mean? So he says, they put, and I don't know how to define it, but here's the example he gives. 
gives. There's a difference between the couple who drive through the rainstorm and the couple who pulls their car to the side to kiss each other. And he said that's real. That actually happened. People are in it to win it, and they're intentional. It becomes their focus, their number one priority. There's a difference between a couple who encourage each other to pursue their own personal goals at the expense of their own discomfort or inconvenience. That's very true, that one. Even if it means their partner has to do certain things that they are very uncomfortable with. The couples who try on a daily basis to experience <coughs> some sort of meaningful connection or create a fun memory are the couples who shattered my perception of what was possible in a loving relationship. I'm thinking of a few examples on the top of my head. I had a friend of mine who married this girl who was very successful, very big law firm, and he was still in college, which is tough for a guy, you know? He got a successful wife, and she was heading to her career, and he had a career, jumped off, went back to law school, you know? So he was always, you know, and then it reflected on her, right? Am I making her like uncomfortable that she's marrying a guy who's uncomfortable that she's like so successful? You know, it's like a, uh, a spiral down. So he used to do a lot of like cute things for her. Once he took her briefcase or bag, whatever it was, and he covered it completely, everything, with post-it notes saying, I love you on it. All right, a little small thing. I thought, hey, big corporate woman, successful. You know? They love it. <laughs> oh, they love it, you know. Reminds me, actually, I was dating my wife. My wife was, at that point, when I was dating my wife, I quit my career. I went back to yeshiva to go to rabbinical school. So I was there for like five years. So I had no money. I still have no money, actually. Um, that's, not a, that's not a point. And she was a CPA. She was a Cooper. She was like, you know, the corporate world, whatever. And I had to meet her for a date. I had to buy something. I had no money. By the third date, she was buying stuff. I literally, I could not afford dates. It was like that, you know? Anyway, so uh, and she still loves me, thank God. And we're on a date. I had to buy something. I don't forget this. I thought, I'm going to buy her. I said, like, if I buy a real gift, I can't afford anything. So I went to a gas station. <laughs> and I bought her. You know, they have these, like, fake roses right, with like, they put a little animal on it, and they spread, smell like a real rose. I couldn't even afford a real rose, exactly. And I brought, and I brought her that, and like stank like toilet freshener. It was like absolutely like, like you know, that, they, 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 the potpourri stuff in the toilets, you know. And I was like, hello. It was like a third, fourth day. I was like, hello. And she was like, you know. And she like made fun of it a little bit. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. That was in my house for like six years in a Coca-Cola bottle. I'm telling you, little, little things like that, that's the, all the fancy stuff, all the restaurants, well, that's gone. No one remembers that stuff. This little piece of garbage junk I just got, uh, that intentional experience you put into it, he's saying, I think that's what he's talking about. You put into it, that stays. Then one of the kids ended up flushing down the toilet, but whatever it was, okay? Okay, here's the best advice he was given. One woman in Georgia gave some pretty amazing advice. She and I like this. She and her husband had been married for 60 years. Okay? And after being asked what her best relationship advice would be, she paused and said, this is my favorite line, don't be afraid to be the one who loves the most. Hmm. That is deep, even for someone in Georgia. Okay? <laughs> don't be afraid to be the one who loves the most. Now, I tell you, everything I've been saying so far and everything I'm going to say is encoded in those words. Let, let those words enter into your cerebellum. Let them go down. Let them enter your hippocampus and just ooze through your body, okay? Because I believe that's a lot of we have are people who are resistant through low self-esteem, through fear of, of rejection, through fear of bad relationships. Fear of whatever, fear of losing their money, to love the most. If you have two people who are willing to love more than the other, you got something. Can you hear that? Yeah? I hope so. That was very, very deep. Okay. And here's the final thing you mentioned. On the best way to solve disagreements, resolving disagreements was one of the topics that came up the most. So what I want to discuss with you is how to have a good fight. Okay, because when things are going well, they're going well. But in every relationship, I always say it's not if you get into a fight, it's when, when you get into a fight, and more importantly, how you fight. There are rules to arguments, okay? And many people think, well, we fought, and therefore, 
the relationship is over, or we can't get along. That's not true. And here's a few ideas which I put together. Number one, by the way, just pay hands. Anyone here fought in relationships? That's an obvious question. Have you fought in relationships and dating? Yeah? yeah. No, no, you have. First date is not a good sign, right? That's not. Yeah. Getting to fight the first date, that's probably not a good sign, right? <laughs> that's not good, no. No, it's not good. No. Hadas, did that happen to you? Yeah. Happened to you? Yeah. It happened to Hadas. <laughs> Miss, some guy makes me pick him up and drop me off. Okay. <laughs> so she's got a first date fight story for everyone, I'm sure. You, wanna, you don't have to share it with me. Oh, if you want to, I don't know. Oh, uh, a guy full of himself and I'm like, you crushed him. Sometimes they just need a reality check. They do. And you know what? It's your job to do that. That's reality check. That's, I hear that. Okay. So here's the, um, here's the first thing when it comes to fighting. Your first date fighting, not good. But by the fourth, fifth, that happens. Disagreements come. Did you ever tell the story of the g- You know, there's a Gomorrah. I just read it today, funnily enough, with my students <laughs> where I teach near here. There's a Gomorrah that says, there's three things you should look for in a relationship. Kiss, to, to uh, evaluate the person you're with. Evaluate the guy or girl you're with. Kiss, cos, cuss. Kiss, cos, cuss. You heard this before? Yeah. What's kiss? Is cheap? Right. Kiss is your pocket, your money. What are people like with money? Okay, what do they spend the money on? Well, they don't know what to spend the money on. It's a great to evaluate what someone is like, okay? What people give, do the people give charities? How people spend the money is very... What's costs? How they, they drink a little bit, okay? What are they when they drink? Which is why you don't drink on a, don't over drink on a date for sure. But save it because once they get drunk, it all comes out, you know? Some people are like, the, oh, everyone hates me, right? They'll be like, woohoo, let's party, right? So you wanna, you're going to figure out what this person's actually like. And the last one is kiss, cuss, and cuss. What they're like when they're angry. When a person's angry, their temper is a very good value. People are very, very nice. And suddenly, they compl- we're discussing, completely lose it. So there's a story of a rabbi. This is a very famous Gemara, Talmudic story. And there's a story of a girl. I mentioned this story before. Who's dating a guy, and she just heard this and wanted to check it. So he goes and picks her up and get into the car. And they're driving along, and they get to a red light, you know. And there is a line you know, in front of him of, uh, of cars. So he pulls to a stop. She leans over, turns off the engine, pulls out the key, and throws out the window. <laughs> so he's like, what the heck? Right? So he has to get out, you know. He has to get out, and he has to look for the... Uh, this happened in Israel, by the way. The story, the story goes, it happened in Israel, which, by the way, is a crazy place to leave a car, to drive anyway, right? <laughs> and to leave a car just there. Because, in, you see, in America, if you don't move when the, when the light turns green, you get honked, yeah. right? They honk you, like the taxis. And it's amazing. It goes from red to green, and it's immediate honk. It's like red, green, <laughs> right? It goes red, green, <laughs> like this, you see? Immediately, you're like, whoa, you know? In Israel, they do it slightly differently. They actually honk you while it's still red. And you're like, excuse me, what, what was that? And then the Israeli tax driver will say, well, it will be green soon. <laughs> it's actually a public service that they, uh, they offer in the land of Israel to uh, all drivers. Anyway, so uh, she leans over, and he's and honking, and he's like looking in the grass for the keys, supposedly, and he finds the keys, and he gets back. You know, it's not going to end good, this whole story, right? You know that, right? Just warning you. And he gets back in the car, and he starts the engine, and he drives off. And he just met this girl, and he's like, do you mind me asking you what that was about? <laughs> and she's like, I was testing you. <laughs> and he's like, really? Why are you testing me? She goes, well, I heard today this Talmudic idea of kiss, cuss, cuss, and I wanted to see if you were going to get angry or not. And he says, well, how did I do? And she says, you passed. And he says, well, you failed. And he turned the car around, dropped it back home again. <laughs> That's the story. Did it happen or not? I don't know. As they say, it's a true story. It just hasn't happened yet. But that is the famous story that gets passed around the, uh, the, the yeshivas. Okay, fine. So this idea of establishing what a person's like when they're angry and when they fight, when they argue, is very important. So number one is, many mistakes people make 
I was going to say men, but it's not true, men or women, is they fight to win. See, when they argue, they think this is a competition and I got to win it. So the key is don't fight to win. It's not a competition. And I tell many people there are many battles you can have, if you want to use the war analogy, but you don't have to, uh, you want to win the war. So you can lose a battle here, lose a battle over there, especially when it comes to dealing with in laws. Now, in laws is its own class, not for this course, but I actually have it online. Dealing with in laws is crazy difficult because in laws are, well, they're crazy. <laughs> and uh, so will you be one day, you'll understand. Okay, fine. So he's found that a huge number of couples talked about how they didn't fight against each other. If you're in love, you're playing for the same team, okay? You can argue, you get frustrated, and it's understandable. However, you're not there to win over, and ha, I showed him, I showed her. That's not the idea of a fight. Number two, that's number one. Number two, seek to understand, all right? It was found that if you're having a hard time playing on the same team, stop fighting and try to understand why the other partner is upset. Now, when you're dating, this one's very, very difficult because you don't even know each other. Right? You've got no idea. People, you know, I think back to uh, my, my dating days, or years in my case, and you find you're with someone, and you'll say something which you think is completely innocuous, right? completely like nothing, and they like explode. You have that experience before? You're like, oh my God, where, where did that come from? What deep well of hell did, uh, did that come from, you know? I remember speaking to one of my teachers about it, and he said a very interesting analogy. It was a psychiatrist, actually. It was a rabbi psychiatrist, Dr. Tversky. And I asked him about this experience, and he gave me the following analogy, which helped me a lot, actually, and I, I, I share this a lot. Imagine you're in a, um, an elevator, and you're walking out the elevator. I've given this example before. You're walking out the elevator, and you brush past a person's arm. Why do you do that? And they go, ow! Ow! That really, really hurt! Oh, what, are you, what are you there for? You're like, whoa, get a life. I just, I just touched you, you know? So what if I told you, however, this person has bad sunburn on their arm? Now it makes sense. Maybe not acceptable how they reacted, but at least it's understandable. At least it's understandable. Everyone has emotional sunburn somewhere in their life. You're going to rub up against it, and it's going to explode. What you need to understand is that sunburn isn't them. It's a piece of their body or their psyche or their emotional personality that got burnt and is in pain. That's all it is, okay? How do you understand that? You seek to understand. Can I give you a personal story over here? I'm married 14 years, right? Thank God. I, I'm, I'm in, I thank God every day in a, in a good marriage. And I do with me. I'm a lousy husband. My wife happens to put a lot of effort you know them, right, into uh, my marriage. So when you first get married, the first year, I was talking to someone a few moments ago, she got married seven months ago, a JC girl. It's very, very, very difficult. So I'll tell you one story that happened to me, which is in my head. You know, I walked into my house, like, the first week of marriage, and my wife said, what are you doing? And I said, what, what, what do you mean? She goes, what are, you, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm standing in our bedroom. I'm, I'm, I'm paying the rent as well. I, I wasn't actually at that point, but I'm, I'm you know, <laughs> I live here too, don't I? So she's like, you're wearing your shoes. So I was like, yeah. She's like, you don't wear shoes in the bedroom, on the carpet. I was like, why not? She goes, because that's not what you do. I'm like, but I want to. Right? It's things like that you argue over. You don't argue over Afghanistan, Obamacare. No one cares about that. I don't care. Right? I care with her. I got, and she's like, well, take your shoes. I don't want to take my shoes. I don't want to take. She's like, control me. I'm just going to control her. And we're fighting, arguing. And, I'm... and eventually, I turned around and I said, let me ask you a question. In your house, when we cool down after like, you know, 10 minutes of like bludgeoning each other, and, uh, you know, and no, we never hit each other, heaven forbid. Well, she hit me, actually. Um, so I said, so what, what was that about? I said, in your, in your parents' house, did you wear shoes around the house? And she'd be like, no, we didn't actually. And actually, to this day, when I visit my in laws, I actually walk in, and there's like a line of shoes. It's like a mosque. You walk in, there's a line of shoes by the front door. You have to walk in. It's like you went to like a Japanese home. You've got to take your shoes off. Like, thank you so much. Right. Now, in the house I grew up in, you used to walk around with shoes on, you see? That's just the way it was. So once you seek to understand a little bit, and in dating, that I've come very, you don't even know each other. You don't know what she's about. You don't know what he's about. You don't know the first thing about each other. 
Right? Once you're actually in here, then start to understand where this comes from. That's usually the way it, uh, the way it happens. So seek to understand. So he found the people who, were, who actually had that and try to find out what's it about, what are we dealing with over here, then they were able to, uh, to fix it. Okay. Okay, this is really important. I, I, I can't stress this one enough. Good relationship, fighting, you have to be nice to each other. Now, that may sound very obvious and basic, and it is, but people forget this. You're not there to fight and argue. You're in a relationship, and you have to be nice to each other. People think, <laughs> this is a big mistake, that when they argue, they can do whatever they want. It can all come out. You know what I'm saying? Like the doors have opened and out it comes. It's like, what? Now the fort, now, now we're fighting. Here it comes and it all comes out. Right? And you remember that thing that happened back in 1975? Remember that? Remember that thing? And we went there and, we went, and they feel as though there's no, like the, the gloves can come off. They can't come off. Just because you're fighting and in an argument doesn't mean that everything else, every other rule, everything else is just totally unraveled and you can say what you want. There are rules to fighting. There's boundaries. There's things you can say and there's things you cannot say. I'll give an example in marriage, which you know, we're all you know, going for over here. In marriage, here's one rule I tell all couples. Don't mention the D word. No matter how bad the fight is, no matter how terrible, you don't mention the D word. What's the D word? Divorce. You don't mention it. It doesn't come out. Well, we're arguing. I'll say what the heck I want. That's it. I'm at it. But you can say I'm upset. You drive me crazy. Why do you have to do that to me? You cry, you scream, you scratch, right? <laughs> and then she'll, you know, she'll scratch you back. So whatever it is, you see, but you don't mention that word. That's a rule. That's it. Now there's, where we go, that's the okay, money. Now, I mentioned this before, but I want to mention it again. People, probably Jews more than other people, actually, have a very, I use the word weird, but a very intense relationship when it comes to money. Okay? There's a lot of fear with money, right? I have to make money, I have to be the breadwinner, right? And now we're in a world where women make lots of money, thank God. Okay? <laughs> thank God every day for that. My wife's got a job. So there's this whole thing do I deserve? There's a lot of. Uh, jokes aside, there's a lot of esteem issues that go with money. You're going to fight over money. And by the way, poor people fight over money, but people with more money fight even more because there's more to fight about. Does that make sense? People think, well, if I've lost money, I won't fight anymore. No, no. I promise you, Steve Jobs, he fought with his wife over money. Right, now, in his case, it was what we give it to. Okay? So there's no doubt about it. Bill Gates, him and Melinda, they're fighting over money. Right? But they're not, they have a different level. For them, do we buy 55 houses or whatever they do? Do we give all that money away? And they get to fight. With charity, by the way, when it comes to giving money away, people can fight over that. Right? That's, a, that's an argument. So when it comes to money issues, it starts to really, and in relationships and dating, it can become, happens to be, many people say, well, I can't get married until I have lots of money. Get married while you're poor. You have nothing to argue over. <laughs> and it sounds crazy. It's okay. I mean, your grandparents, all your grand, they all got married poor. Right? It's okay, but I've got to make money to get married first. No, there's going to be more trouble when it comes to that. So one thing I tell people to do, first of all, in dating, slightly different, by the way, in dating, how much you make and all that kind of stuff, family money is no one's business. Right? One way to know a person is, has lack of boundaries, they ask you too, much, too many questions about personal money issues. Okay? Once you get married, however, it's all out there. You know? So you're going to fight over money. So here's something I always tell people to do, and this works in any other area of relationship that's, that's causing trouble. It could be in-laws, right? It could be work. There's certain trigger things that, that arguments come up in. Even in dating, it's going to happen. So the key is you can't argue about whatever you want, whenever you want. There's times to argue. There's actually places to argue. Right? There's also people not to argue in front of. Right? Certain people, places, and things. People, places, things trigger arguments. So when it comes to money, when I, you know, get, so once a month, my wife pays the bills. Uh, funny, in my relationship, and by the way, I suggest this, not many guys here, but those who are listening as well, I find it better, if possible, for the woman to run the finances. There's a rule. We discuss at 8 p.m. And it happens to be, if you choose a certain time, 8 p.m. on a Thursday night, or whatever it is, and you'll find that, you know what? By the time you get to 8 p.m. on a Thursday night, your fears have all gone. Right? Because happening at that moment, you're not really worried about it. It's because things come and go. 
And that's going to happen in any relationship, any dating. And I should do a whole class just on this, on preparing a wedding. As a person who has, thank God, I'm very blessed to have performed 80 weddings or so in my time, here's one thing I see a lot. You go from dating, which is fun and great, and he's so cute, and he's always laughing, and she's so beautiful and so lovely, and then you enter this crazy world of parents and relatives and making a wedding and money, and you've got to give her, and she's got to give him, and who pays for what? It turns into this great, I always say, if you can survive marriage, wedding, prep, you can marry the rest of your life because it's crazy intense. All the stuff you're fearful of, parents, crazy uncles, and aunts getting involved, and all that, and it all comes together into one big, I don't say waste of money, but one big financial every single time, whether it's a small wedding or I did a wedding in the Grand Hyatt, as I mentioned before, that cost more than my house, okay? They also thought, okay, so for my wedding, it was like, how many people can we have? At their wedding, is it this China or is it more expensive? And wherever you are, you've got it. So every time you're freaking out about that kind of thing, that preparation, whatever it is, you can't just let it come out. Right? You find a time, a place, a location, a mood, and the most important thing, never, ever argue hungry. <laughs> never. I learned this from my mother. God bless her. She should live and be well. Because I want the stuff from my father. And she always said to me, don't ask Abba for anything when he's hungry. I have a very, by the way, my father's a very mild madam man. My father never got angry at all. Always <coughs> calm. God bless him. You should live and be well. Right? Always calm. But if you're hungry, you don't want people asking you for anything. All I want is food. So when you come to the door, you think, oh, Abba, I want this thing. I want the Nintendo. I, oh, my dear, the Atari. I want the Atari. <laughs> no, you don't. Wasn't that great, the Atari? It had wood paneling on it. Why can they make games with wood paneling? How cool was that, you know? So you can't, I got it, by the way, in the end. I got my Atari. I had it in college, even. So yeah, he, dad comes in, he's hungry. You don't ask him then. She knew, because she knew when to ask my dad for stuff, you know? So whatever you do, don't ask him then. Wait till he's... Works for us, too. There's times, places, feelings, emotions, and you can't freak out about everything. And there's plenty of stuff when you're dating and plenty of stuff when you're married to freak out over. A wedding happens to be a really big example. So in all the weddings I've done, pretty much everyone, there's some... Right? Friction involved. And what happens is a lot of the time, oh, we're jumping ahead of ourselves a little bit, God willing, but you'll get there, is that the parents don't want to argue. They're embarrassed to argue. So basically, the, his parents communicate to him, and then her parents communicate to her, and they start arguing on behalf of their parents. Horrible. I've seen relationships break up over it. I've seen relationships, engagements break up over stupid things. Stupid things. Real nonsense. I'm dealing with something now where I'm seeing this happen, and it's not nice. It has to be pushed back, has to be told. You can't change the parents, but at least you can decide how you argue and when you do it. I don't know how I got to all of that, but one of the I want to say is just be nice to each other. Seriously. Don't be a jerk. Don't call each other names. Don't take jabs. Don't try to hurt the other person. Whatever you need to do, to just be a nice person. I believe that is the key to all marriage. Just be nice to each other, okay? Here's uh, one of the favorite quotes from the interviews. This is beautiful, by the way. I'm not there yet, but this is nice. And you're going to be like, uh, well, the girls will be like, uh, and the boys will be like, when's the football on? Okay. <laughs> At the end of Ty's life, is that a word, name, T-Y? Is, is that short for something? Tyler. Tyler. Tyler, oh, I like that. At the end of Ty's life, I want him to be able to say, what's a he? Terry was the greatest earthly blessing in my life, the best thing that ever happened to me, and that I'm a better person because of how she loved me, and that's the goal that I live with every day. That's how I want to love this man. Isn't that nice? Sound good? <laughs> What a pathetic, heartless bunch you are. <laughs> you know what? It's too many movies and too much garbage you're uh, talking with each other. Okay. We have a few more minutes. 
let's finish off with another short list of how to take arguments. And then we'll take stories and questions. I'm sure you've all experienced this. Okay, number one, take it private, keep it private. It's no one's ever business. Who you argue, never argue in front of other people. There's no reason. One of the worst sins of Judaism, I'll let you know, is to embarrass, embarrass someone else in front of others. It's considered to be a kin, you won't believe this, but if you embarrass someone and they get white or red or flushed or whatever in front of others. It's akin in Judaism to killing them. Hard to believe. Now, it's not a capital crime, thank God, or we're in big trouble, but Judaism makes a big deal of not embarrassing other people. Fighting and shouting in front of other people is not acceptable. All they have to do is one visit to Target, right? One visit to any of these stores and the fights we'll get into, in the, oh, it's unbearable, you know? I mean, I'm addicted to it. I love watching it, but really, it's not, a, it's not acceptable, okay? By the way, Fighting in front of children, you're going to do it. But just remember I told you this, is not acceptable. You don't want to fight in front of your kids. You know your parents will be like, <laughs> in the room? That was actually good. They're doing you a favor. Okay? It's, they, it, it's akin to child abuse, they say. Okay? It can scar children emotionally. Never mind your inner child. Okay, number two, keep it relevant. Don't bring up old grudges and sore points where they don't belong on a particular argument. Okay, there's boundaries. We're arguing over this, not everything else. Keep it real. Deal with the issue at hand, not with the symptom of the problem. People want to get back to, so tell me about your, right, your, your childhood. It's not about. Avoid character assassination. Stay focused on the issue rather than deteriorate to the point of attacking the person you're with personally. Remain task-oriented. Know what you want going into the disagreement. Okay, why am I fighting? What, what is this actual argument really all about. Why are we in this? You're going to do that sometimes. Sometimes you get into an argument about something and you argue so long and so hard, you actually forget what you're arguing about. Like, what, what, what were we arguing about? I don't know. But anyway, you told me that, you know what I'm saying? Complete insanity. This is also very, very important. I'm giving you gold over here. <laughs> Allow for your partner to retreat in dignity. Right? The ha moment is not acceptable. Okay, you won, you were right, you managed somehow to prove it, you managed to show them that the song was actually sung by Beyonce and not some other person, or that scene was in that movie, not that movie, you know that fight, you've all had that one before. I'm telling you now we have YouTube, thank God. What did you do before YouTube, right? You can prove anything. You have to go to the blockbusters and actually get the video out. Now you can prove whatever you want all the time. Ha! Let the person retreat within. You know, I would have made the same mistake myself. Now you're thinking... Not really, because I'm not a jerk, but you can't say that. Okay, you've got to allow people to retreat with dignity. Be proportional in your intensity. Okay? People think you can just get in and just crush. There's, there's, there's amount of intensity you can fight with. Some things are worth intense, and some things are just not. You know, there's got to be a, a limit. This is true when it comes to partners, and it's true when it comes to kids as well. You know, I can't punish my one of my kids for walking in and leaving dirty footprints on the floor by banning them from college. It's just, it's out of, you know what I'm saying? It's out of proportion. You've got to keep things proportional. And finally, time limit. Okay, there's a time limit, right? Put on the clock. I know someone did this once, by the way. Oh, I knew someone, actually, a couple were very close to, had a good, good marriage, actually. And when they argued, I think we started when they were dating, they weren't allowed to speak to each other, they had to write it down. They used to fight via paper. Imagine that. So they just write it down. And they found it. And Valjean, I was like, okay, forget about it. You know what I'm saying? Like, at some point, oh my God. I mean, how much can you write eventually? They find, so she'd be like, she has to wait. It was his turn to write. He said, like okay, so if you can't do that, okay, I don't know if the modern version is texting or emailing, probably not a good tip. But um, I'm saying it has to be face, oh, face to face. This is very, very important. Very, very important. I heard this idea actually from a, uh, a, a, a social worker. A very good point. But it's based upon a Jewish concept. The, 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 the uh, deeper Torah commentators say that Adam and Eve, when they were created, were actually back to back, like this. You see? They were back to back. They were created as one being. And then God separated them, not just the rib, separated them completely. And how were they? They were then facing each other. So the commentators say, what's the big deal? Let them stay back to back. Okay, so they'll talk to each other, right? And they'll talk that way. And you can hear like that way, you see? And they say, no, all communication must happen face to face. So the social work was giving this presentation at a, at a, uh, at a workshop. I went to this rabbinical, um, like, getaway thing. 
and uh, he was talking, and he said that he found when he would talk to couples, dating or married, and they were having trouble, they didn't look at each other when they fought. Right? They would look, she would look this way, and he would look that way, and he would make them face each other and actually look at each other. And they were doing it subconsciously. I was talking to someone recently, actually, who said that they, they realized that one thing, when they community, they were not facing, you've got to look at each other. Right? Part of the concept of, of us like looking is that we, we, we should face, part of humanity is to face each other. You see, Animals look down, right? but we look up. Right? We have the ability to look up and communicate with each other. Okay? So face-to-face -face communication is very, very important as well. There's a time limit. You can make a time limit, put a clock on it, and say at some point this stops. Otherwise, it can go on and on and on. And that very will finish with a very famous concept, which is the, in marriage that we say, is that you don't, some even told me this, don't go to bed angry. Right? You've heard that one before, right? That's a very, very true one. You know? You've got to others, you're boiling, and you're, you've got to try to, calm, doesn't mean you're best friends, you've got to calm it down. And I'm going to add to this as well, for marriage as well, you don't sleep in separate rooms, no matter how bad the argument is. Okay, he could be on the floor, but you're in the same room, okay? That's how we keep a certain structure and dynamic to the relationship. That's the information I wanted to cover tonight. Any questions, thoughts, or comments on anything we said before we wrap it up? Any good stories, like Hadassah's about, yeah. There's a question on the topic of money that you brought up. Yeah. Great question. At what point... Right, so at what point do you... So here's the tricky thing. It's, you, you at what point do you actually reveal... Thank you for asking that. Okay, so the answer is it's up to the person. Okay, it's never the other partner say like, tell me how much. It's up to the person. I know someone who was dating someone and had no idea that the person they were dating actually came from an extremely wealthy family. Okay, I think that's a very, very good thing. Okay, they happen to find out accidentally through another, like, are you sure? Like, yeah, are you sure that, what, in no, a different family? No, no, that's the family. I think it's very, very healthy. Um, it's up to you. I would say that there is no reason to bring it up at all. <laughs> Sounds crazy, but it's no one else's business. At the engagement, maybe, you know, when it comes to dividing up the, you know, wedding preparation, but before then, it's no one's business. Sounds weird, I know. That's my personal opinion. I see no benefit in it whatsoever. You know, if a person's struggling up to pay, like me, I was dating, I, I got to point right out of money. So I literally, I said, listen, I don't have money right now. And I was full-time studying, and I was working very, very hard, and, and I didn't have any, uh, so she had to start chipping in for the, uh, you know, for all the stuff. That could be. But otherwise, it's up to you. And I always think later the better. It takes away the focus from where it's meant to be, because it has no relevance on the success of your relationship whatsoever. I'll say that again. It has no relevance on the success of your relationship whatsoever. I've seen poor couples argue, and I've seen rich couples argue. It just doesn't fix it. Can I just throw something out there? Please, throw away. Ah. Okay, that's a, that's a very, very good point. So when it comes to debt, as opposed to having money, then to see and to try to find out what's going on. Listen, people can hide stuff anyway. I know people have gone into stuff and they've just like never, never known. That is a very, very good point. If you can somehow establish that some way through a third party, you're entitled to do it in terms of the debt and what they owe. Right, people are irresponsible. I know, I've seen, I, I, I used to say you can see it. I know people who've managed to hide it. I know people who've managed to hide their, um, their crazy financial um, relationships. You know, what can I say? I hear it. But that is a very, very indicative sign of where a person is. Um, yeah. 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 I don't know the solution to that one. Hi. Can I, can I ask you a favor? 
can I come on your dates with you? Just so you know, I'm, I'm married. I was like, I just want to see you on a date because your dates must be absolutely fantastic. I don't know what's happening to your dates. Everything's so good. It's like vanilla. I'm like, I'm coming. I'll be sitting there like this. I'll be like, I'll be, like, I'll be eating popcorn. I'll be like, like, is there a guy watching us with a yarmulke? And I go, no, this is the rabbi. Just the rabbi is there. Go, I'm sure he's been watching us. Is he following us? No. Nah. He's, he seems to be what? He's by himself eating popcorn, drinking beer. What's he doing? Okay, sorry, Adas, you were saying. Yes. Okay, you're in a relationship and it's. Okay, so you go on a date. Yeah. And, like, he's normal, he's nice, but like it's kind of vanilla. You know, yeah. it's a little funny. Yeah. Um, so I was like, funny, haha, or funny, weird? No, no, like funny, like haha, but like not like hilarious. <laughs> okay, okay, basically, you're not dating Jerry Seinfeld. We get it. Okay, he's not there yet. Yeah. Really good like yeah. it's the so they're laughing. I've mentioned this before. My policy always is, unless you are offended by this terrible creature who's drooling all over himself, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and oozing various bodily fluids, the general rule is you should try to go on a second date. The first date, I, I always say, why do you go on a first date? So that the second date's not the first date. Why are you on a first date? Because a son, unless you're complete, this is like you're convinced. I found, I know many people, I know many people, including my wife, who had to push themselves to go on a second date because people say and do very stupid things on a first date. They're very scared, very, very embarrassed. And I believe that it's worth, one second, we'll get there. I found that it's worth going on a second date. And let me share one other thing. And this is a rule I've always found. This, I, I'm, I'm pretty much... Right, 10 for 10 on this one. Whenever a girl comes back, or a guy comes back and says, that first date was fantastic. This guy, he's so funny. He's so good. Like, oh my God, we were up all night talking, laughing. Rabbi, and I hear this, best friend, in my head, not going to happen. Never work. <laughs> when she comes back and says, I say, how was he? Yeah, I'm like, woo. <laughs> woo, room with a chance. Hey, hey. Right? We've got, a, we've got a possibility over here. That's my own personal experience. And I think the reason is because if you start up there, it can only go down. Right? And most guys... So at what point do you think that you should just call it quits? Great question. Great question. You want to my opinion on that? Mm -hmm. By the sixth date... And by the way, when I say sixth date, I mean just one-on-one. -on -one. No, no. It doesn't mean you're getting engaged. I'm not saying you get engaged after six dates. I'm saying if you are on serious dates... By six dates, you can know whether there is potential for a relationship here. Yeah. Do you understand? Yeah. By date, look, some people can do it by date three, some people by date one. But I think by date six, if you're still pushing and pushing yourself to go out with him or her, then already. So you shouldn't get engaged after six. I'm not saying that. But by date six, any person with any self knowledge should know whether there's potential for a long term relationship. No, six dates? Six years, no one else, I'm not, by the way, group date is not dates. Phone is not date. Skype is not date. I'm talking a live date, one-on-one, -on -one, Manuel Womano, right? That, <laughs> that is going to be the, that's going to be the. Regardless, isn't there like, you're saying the first date, but there, are there, are, aren't there some like rules or situations where it's a, it's a down singer, obviously, because, I mean, I've gone on a few days where it's like, they're okay and I wanted to give it a try, but I never heard, a, either I never heard back from them or... The By the way, if you never hear back from them, they don't want to go out with you. That's a... I'm just hazarding a guess. But I have one story that every single time I tell, people are completely shocked. First date, he brought his mother. Isn't that a bit of a little like, buzzkill? First date, he brought his mother. <laughs> wow. That is... That is awesome. I've waited a long time to hear a comment like that. You ain't been in that. Adult. That is awesome. He brought his date on the first date, your mother on the first date. Love it. Okay, we'll stop over there. That's awesome. You made my night. Okay, we'll stop over there. Thank you, guys. We'll pick this up next week.